So, unfair cryptogram. The puzzle itself comes from 2011, and this is what we were given. Something with the title, unfair cryptogram, and then a bunch of weird repeating gibberish. Now, it turns out that these are all sort of directional uh, arrows, A's, B's, X's, and Y's, and it took our team a little bit of time to figure out that these are all video game directions. And after staring at this a little bit longer, we realized that there are some classic video game cheat codes included here, such as this one, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, also known as the Konami code. So we, especially with the title here, started thinking that maybe these various video game codes are actually part of a giant cryptogram, where items such as the Konami code might, in fact, be the letter B, for example. Of course, we didn't know which code was what letter, or even all the codes that were out there. So the first part of our data collection involved determining what all the codes that were used were. The next item that we did is, for our own sanity, we had to replace each of those codes with a symbol so that we could then start doing so that we could then start decrypting those symbols. Now we didn't know what was going to be what, so we basically just did it randomly with letters. So after determining what all the cheat codes were, and I'm not actually going to show you what those cheat codes are, it's sort of unimportant at this point. Like I said, we replaced them with random letters, and here is what we got. So the first line of code once we change everything over, reads SZLJ space NP space ULNG. Now again, like I said, these are just random letters we chose. We knew these weren't going to spell anything, and we were pretty sure we were going to have to try to somehow decode this message. But we're not going to really be able to do that very well from a Word document. So instead, we changed over to Excel. Within this spreadsheet, we then applied several of the items that we've been discussing so far. The first thing we needed to do was that in our Word document, each of the lines were preceded by a number. This was for our benefit. It was just the number that it appeared in, the, uh, in order of the Word document that we put together. So we wanted to quickly remove all those numbers. And what we used for that is, again, it's a little bit complex. What we're doing is we want to take everything to the right of the closed parentheses because we closed off each number with a parenthesis. So what we're doing is we're looking at the string in A2. We want the length of that string and then we want to rem take everything to the right of that string except for whatever precedes the first open paren or closed parentheses. And that's what the search function is doing. Finally, we're removing one more letter because there's a space after that closed parenthesis. So what that's going to leave us with is just the, st the string without the preceding numbers. The next thing that we needed to do in order to start decrypting all of this is that we needed each letter individually. And this is actually going to be another way you could use the mid function. Instead of indexing in to pick out specific letters, we just want to separate everything. So what I've done up here is I've just listed the numbers 1 through 13. Then, in each cell here, I am looking at the <clears throat> string of text in C, and then I'm taking the letter in that string of text corresponding to this number up in the first row. So I'm taking the first letter in column E, 
the second letter in column F, and so on. Now, one thing you might note within this formula is you see a couple of dollar signs. Tony mentioned before that using formulas is really handy because you can quickly change up what it is that you're referring to. If I got this name, if, if I got this wrong here, I could change from a G to a K very easily, and it would flow through everything. But what does that dollar sign do? The dollar sign basically locks in part of the formulaic reference. So this formula reference here is referring to C2, but when I copy it down or copy it across, you know, I want the formula in column F to also refer to C2 and G to refer to C2. Similarly, as I copy things down here in row 4, I still want to be using the number 1 that I have in the first column. I can't index, I can't use the letter L with the mid function for what number I want, or what number I want to index into my text string. So what the dollar sign in an Excel formula does is what it directly proceeds, it says, don't change that, uh, don't change that reference. So all throughout here, you'll notice with the dollar sign C2, that's staying the same. Similarly, with the dollar sign F1, you'll notice that while the, uh, you'll notice that the 1 stays the same all the way throughout. So that's just a handy formulaic trick. So what's my next step? Using the mid function, instead of indexing into the text string, I have separated that text string out. So each letter is now individual. And I can start doing things with these letters. With a cryptogram like this, it can often be handy to get a count of the number of letters so that I know, okay, what should I replace this letter with? Well, E is the most commonly used letter in the English language, so whatever is whatever dummy letter I'm using here use, is used the most, let's replace that with an E. So that's what I'm doing over here. I just have listed every single letter in the English alphabet, A through Z, and then over here, I went through all of my string, or all of my strings that I broke out, and I'm using the COUNTIF function. COUNTIF is a little bit complex, but what it does is it looks for items in this block here that are similar to whatever is in cell Z2, in this case, the letter A. And every time something in my block from E2 to Q48 looks like a letter A, it gets a 1. In this case, there are no A's, but there are 41 D's, there are 16 H's, and so on. So once I've done this, the next step is to actually start replacing items. One thing you'll notice when we look at the letter distribution is that there are a couple of repeats. For example, dummy letter C and dummy letter N both appeared 11 times, and we needed to differentiate these. That's what I'm doing on sheet 2. You'll notice here on sheet 2, I once again have my list of all the letters broken out individually, and then over here, I have a set of three columns. The first column is my gibberish letter. The second column is the frequency with that letter appears. But what we've done is we've gone through and we've made each of these numbers unique. So you'll notice C and N both appeared 11 times. So I now have 11A and 11B. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the VLOOKUP function to replace each of the individual letters I have in my gibberish string with its frequency distribution. So what I'm doing here, ignore the if statement, just pay attention to the VLOOKUP. What VLOOKUP does 
is that it takes four arguments. The first argument is what you want to look for. In this case, I want to look for the value in cell C4. So I want to look for an S. The second argument that VLOOKUP takes is where I'm looking for that letter. So I'm going to look for it in these columns here, my gibberish letters and my frequencies. My third statement in VLOOKUP is of the columns that I gave it, it's going to find the letter in the first column. It has to find, VLOOKUP has to find things in the first column. And then this number says, okay, replace that letter with the entry corresponding to that letter in column blank. So in this case, I want to replace it with whatever is in column 2 that corresponds with S. So that's going to be the number 5. The last item here, the false, is a, either true or false. Most of the time you want to use false. What that will do is that it will look for S and only look for S. It can get tricky sometimes when you're VLOOKUPing with numbers. If you're looking for the number 5 and there is no 5 in your list, then it will find whatever entry is directly after 4. Most of the time, you're going to use VLOOKUP false. So with that formula, I've now replaced every single one of my letters with its frequency distribution. And this brings us one step closer to our answer, which is then going to be replacing these frequency distributions with actual letters. So what we did in the puzzle was we went online and found a distribution of where what the commonality that each letter appears in the English language. And we effectively just took the most common appearing letter and paired it with the most common gibberish letter that we had. So that was 41, we replaced it with E. The second most common letter is an R, and so we replaced the second most commonly appearing letter with an R. Once we have once we decided which real letters we thought went where, we simply copied and pasted our string of frequencies and then used VLOOKUP once more. And unfortunately, the formula isn't on this sheet here, but we used VLOOKUP to look at 5. And this time, instead of looking at the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, we looked at the frequency column and we looked for what frequency, what letter appears with frequency 5, and that corresponds to B. So we got for this 5, it becomes a B. For the 6, it became an L. And this slowly started spelling out a couple of clues. So for example, the first block of text spelled out, blow up your own ship in Gradius 3. Now Gradius 3 is an a game for the Super Nintendo, and there is a cheat code that could be used to blow up your own ship in Gradius 3. In fact, it's the Konami code, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA. And we knew from our cryptography before that this code corresponded to a letter. The decoded letter that it corresponded to was A. Once we did this for the entire puzzle, and collected all of the new cheat codes that were referenced and again decrypted those cheat codes using the same method we had used before. It spelled out ashamed, which was the answer to this puzzle. This is obviously a pretty complex puzzle that requires some pretty intermediate slash advanced um, spreadsheet skills, but it's also a kind of a cute example of a lot of times in a puzzle you'll have these kind of multiple stages where you'll have to apply the previous kind of procedure that you use to get data out of the puzzle to the second level of data to get the final answer, right? The series of, of references to cheat codes are not in of enough in and of themselves. You have to go back and apply that same kind of you know code breaking to it to get to that final answer. 
Well, that was obviously an example of a more advanced, uh, complicated puzzle that really would be pretty impossible to solve if you weren't doing things with a spreadsheet. Doing that by hand uh, would be the road to madness. So thank you for saving us from that, Evan. My um, pleasure, Tony. Anything else that we should review as far as things that people really want to know going into the mystery hunt? I think we're uh, pretty good on that. If you do think of anything, though, after watching this tutorial that you have questions about, please feel free to get in touch with either myself or Tony. You can find our contact information on our wiki user pages, and we'd be happy to answer any of your Excel questions to the best of our ability, or to review in more depth anything that we've done in this tutorial if you have specific questions about it. There is an Excel magic page on the wiki, uh, which has kind of a text version of a lot of the things we've talked about today. Uh, we also link from that to a spreadsheet of common functions um, for working with spreadsheets in, in Google Spreadsheets. Uh, that includes equations that you could copy and paste into your own spreadsheets as you're working on the Mystery Hunt puzzle. So hopefully that'll be a time saver for you. It will also contain everything that was within this tutorial as well, so you can poke through all that stuff and take a look at it. Well, I think that's all for today. Um, we'll see you at the hunt. Looking forward to it, Tony.